The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The U.S. Ambassador to Canada wants to rebuild trust between our countries. Tonight, he's here to explain how he and the Biden administration hope to do that. Then, some advice from financial planner Jackie Porter for these inflationary times. And Canadian photographer Tom Sandler on getting the Royals on film as they toured Ontario. It's Tuesday, October 4th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. The United States and Canada are so much more than neighbors. In trade, in defense, in language, and a long, complicated history of migration back and forth across borders, our countries are deeply intertwined, yet very different. Maybe that's been most obvious during difficult times, including some recently, when tough talk put noses on both sides of the border out of joint. No need to name names here. There is a new U.S. ambassador to Canada. He is David Cohen, and he joins us now in our studio, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our studio, oh, Ambassador. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you have to... I'm going to give, give you a nice, easy question off the top here, and you have to do your best... Not <laughs> I, didn't to know, give, I didn't know there were any easy questions. Well, here, here comes. I'm giving you fair right. warning, but you can't give me a real sucky answer, okay? okay. You've got to give me a level on-the-level answer. You've had the job for almost a year now. You've traveled all over the country. You've mm -hmm. met lots of people. Tell me something interesting maybe what's the most fascinating thing you've learned about canada and canadians you didn't know before you got the job so i'm going to i'm going to give you two answers to that one is the serious answer which is a really important answer um, and that is that i did not fully appreciate um, the loss of trust that had occurred between for on the part of canadians for their relationship with the united states as you said in the introduction the, the, the relationship between our two countries has historically been incredibly special import, and important in every dimension, trade, defense, intelligence, values, our leadership on the world stage. But it had taken a hit in the last five years, and I did not fully appreciate the impact that that had on Canadians and the trust that they had for the United States and for the relationship. And I've tried to spend a lot of my time here and really have said that one of my most important responsibilities is to rebuild that trust. So that's the, that is the, that's the, I think the serious answer. I think the slightly less serious answer is how big this country is <laughs> and how diverse it is. Um, I, I was bound and determined, I got very good advice before I came here to remember that I'm the ambassador to Canada, I'm not the ambassador to Ottawa. So I got very good advice to get out of Ottawa, as I like to say, to get out of the Ottawa bubble. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that um, the diversity of perspective, the diversity of approach in the different areas of this country um, is significant and it is interesting and it helps, it absolutely helps inform how we build and rebuild an incredible relationship between our two countries. Not to belabor the first point that you made, but uh, I will remind people watching this right now that uh, I think the man, the current president calls the former guy, once called the Prime Minister of Canada very dishonest and weak. His trade advisor said there was a special place in hell for the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, how how deeply damaged, you know, there's, there's personalities and relationships go up and down all the time, but how deeply damaged in terms of long-term important relations between our two countries do you think was done? So I, I don't think there has been deep long-term damage done between the, in the relationship between our two countries. And I, you know, I, I mean, there were, there were terrible things said and done about the prime minister, but about the country and about Canadians. Um, and um, I, it, it's, not, it's not my style. More importantly, it's not Joe Biden's style. And I think you've seen Joe Biden go out of his way um, to make sure that he expresses publicly and repeatedly the affection that he has for Prime Minister Trudeau, the he coming up? closeness of their relationship. He wants to come up. Mm -hmm. It's presidential scheduling is is a complicated endeavor. You don't say. Um, How long but, have you known the president for? So I've known the president for almost 30 years um, and met him more, you know, 
quasi-socially and socially politically was very close to his son, Bo, mm -hmm. and really was, I mean, the, the, the then senator asked if I would serve as a bit of an advisor to Bo as he embarked on and pursued his political career. Um, and so that enabled me to stay in touch with his whole family. I mean, uh, the president, um, Dr. Biden, um, their, their, their other kids, a couple of kids went to Penn, which I was associated with. So there was a lot of connectivity on a personal level over the course of the, of the past 25 or 30 years. Because I've heard you guys know each other so well that you are kind of, uh, what do we got, like the Biden whisperer. You know what he's thinking, right? Now, we, have, we have a very good relationship. I have, I have um, on a personal level, we have a very good relationship, but I am, I am just so proud that he is my friend because he is, he is simply one of the most decent human beings you will ever meet. And this is a quality that is not necessarily present in all of our leading elected officials in the world. And that fundamental decency infects his instincts around decision making, around people he surrounds himself with, and the relationships that he wants to have with people. And I think it, it just makes him uniquely suited to be president of the United States and and I think the, und the undisputed leader of the world's democracies in these very troubled times. Well, we, uh, okay, here's my follow-up, because uh, the people watching and listening to this would like to know how fundamentally decent he and you intend to be to Canada over the next period of time that you have the responsibilities that you now have. And, and the president did say, quote, instead of relying on foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. And I put make it in America at the heart of my economic plan. And when people in this country hear that, and of course, we're a big trading uh, country, we wonder whether we should be nervous when we hear these kinds of statements. So I'm happy to say that Canada has no reason to be nervous. And um, yep, you know, elected officials and presidents um, say a lot of things, and they say them at different times in different contexts. The language you were quoting came from the State of the Union address where the president was trying to make a point about the importance of the integrity of United States supply chains, but most of the reference was dealing with the integrity of those supply chains as, in, as, as a defense mechanism against autocratic countries like China and Russia. They, those comments, by the way, were prescient with what has happened with Russia, Ukraine, and Russia trying to hold the world hostage with its energy, uh, with its energy exports, and it's, that's exactly the kind of behavior that the president was trying to protect against. So I would, I would refer you to almost contemporaneous comments, mm. which were a joint statement made by the president and the prime minister on the one-year anniversary of the roadmap for a renewed partnership between the United States and Canada, which first of all sets out a comprehensive strategic and tactical partnership based on six pillars of the United States and Canada working together okay, but even to advance economic interest. And on that one year anniversary, in that statement, there is a line in that statement which talks about the importance of the United States and Canada working together to preserve and to grow the integrated supply chains that form the basis of an economic relationship between the United States and Canada. Ambassador, that's all great. Except, I have to remind you, there are times when this administration has put bills before Congress about Buy American, which requires our people to go down there and start lobbying like crazy to get the Canadian exemption. <coughs> so we wonder how much you love us, actually. Well, let's talk about Buy America, Buy American, two different concepts, by the way. Um, first of all, it is a common, that both of those principles apply to federal procurement only. So they're not protectionist in any way whatsoever. Um, a, protectionist, a protectionist approach would limit Canadian business participation in the overall trade and economic relationship mm -hmm. with the United States. I'll remind you <laughs> that the, that trade relationship is 2.6 billion Canadian dollars a day. Mm -hmm. 
It is Canada's largest trade relationship. It is the United States' largest trading relationship. And on top of the national figures, more than 30 states in the United States count Canada as their number one export partner. That doesn't sound very protectionist to me. But it we talks occasionally about, have to remind you of that all talk, the time. Well, you don't have to remind me Not about you, it. But you don't have to remind me about it. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it is simply a common element of f national procurement policy to at times favor businesses located in the country spending the money. Mm -hmm. Canada has, by Canadian policies, in its federal procurement. And uh, as recently as COVID procurement, Canada, um, imp Canada implicated its by Canadian standards to limit purchases of COVID supplies, personal protective equipment to Canadian businesses in an explicit by Canadian policy. So these are not, I mean, they, these are not tensions. They're the way countries do business. Um, and it's simply, I mean, Canada doesn't have to come down to Washington and beg to, for waivers and carve-ins and things like that. It's just all part of an ongoing dialogue which, which occurs in the context of the legislation and the context of the relationship. And the great thing about the United States-Canadian relationship is that there is enough affection, there's enough trust among the negotiators and the people working on this that these things get worked through. And okay. they get worked through in a way that works for Canada and that works for the United States. And, you know, take the electric vehicle tax credit as a, as a great example. That got worked out. It got worked out in a way that was very favorable to Canada. The, the, the new standards in the... Um, there was a lot of scary it, headlines it, before they got but there, there were, But they, I don't think those scary headlines were justified because it was a proposal in a proposed piece of legislation that I did not believe was going to pass. Okay. And it turned out not to pass. So that got worked out in the sign of how powerfully beneficial that arrangement is to Canada is that the rest of our allies are throwing a temper tantrum about it, threatening to go to the WTO, mm -hmm. World Trade Organization, yeah. complaining about it. So the, the European Union, the UK, Germany, all the rest of our allies are upset about the arrangement that we have worked through in the way we always figure out a way to work through mutually beneficial trade relationships with Canada. Okay, let me ask about foreign affairs. We're in a dangerous world right now. Which countries, in your judgment, are uh, the greatest threat to our two countries? Well, um, um, I don't have a long list. I guess that's the good news. I'm going to put two countries on the list. Um, one is Russia. Um, and obviously, Russia has demonstrated its unreliability in the world through its illegal and unprovoked um, invasion of Ukraine, which involves some of the most horrific acts uh, that have been conducted in a, in, a, in a war proceeding in the past century or two. Um, and the Russia as an autocracy um, is a threat to democracies, um, and it is a threat to the United States and Canada as well. Second country is China, which is a more, a more subtle, um, but I think an equally, an equally dangerous relationship. Dangerous um, in what way? But dangerous because, um, dangerous because of China's capacity um, to disrupt trade relationships, and because of its of the unreliability, if you will, of Chinese allies um, from a defense perspective. So China controls an enormous percentage of critical minerals on a global basis. Those critical minerals are going to be necessary for our climate transition. To have to rely on China to supply the lithium for batteries for electric vehicles um, at whatever price China may end up wanting to charge for that is dangerous for our climate ambitions, and it's a dangerous reliance for an unreliable autocratic country. So that's an economic and a trade basis. Do you think we're too soft on China in this country? So I, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think 
think? I don't think I can say yes to that. I, I don't think, I mean, China says, I mean, sorry, Canada says all the right things at the right time. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know that they're, I, I, and I think Canada is working on a more fully developed, articulable policy and approach toward China. I mean, uh, Secretary of State Blinken laid out the United States approach to China. It's clear, it's definable, it's innovate internally, innovate on the things where we can control the markets and economies, get together with our allies and join with our allies to, um, to be in a position to take advantage of that internal innovation and then compete against China. We can't cut China off. They're second largest economy in the world. By the way, they're the one of the largest top two climate emitter. If we're going to be serious about taking on climate change, we have to work with China to be able to do that. On the other hand, we can work with them and compete against them where it's appropriate to do so, but we can call them out for their distortive market practices for their human rights violations. We can take them on when they are not competing fairly or appropriately and when they are um, imposing unfair labor standards on their workforce um, and, and, and when they are engaging in arbitrary detention, an effort, by the way, in which Canada has led the way in the world for the declaration against arbitrary detention. So. That's the United States policy. It's pretty clearly articulated. Innovate, collaborate, and compete. Okay. I want to circle back to something you said earlier in our discussion about Joe Biden being essentially the the sort of leader of the democratic forces of the world right now. And and share with you a public opinion survey, which, uh, well, those of us who like democracy found somewhat disturbing. You know, there's a new report from a UK-based think tank called Onward, which shows that 6 in 10, 18 to 34-year-olds, agree with this expression. Having a strong leader who does not have to bother with parliament and elections would be a good way of governing this country. 18 to 34-year-olds, 6 in 10 believe that. Um, That's in the UK. Similar numbers in the United States, and I'm sad to say in Canada as well. Why does this next generation coming up, in your judgment, seem to find um, increasing authoritarianism uh, appealing. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that that answer is authoritarianism. By the way, I have I have two sons in that age group, mm-hmm. um, and they, I mean, they're both fantastic. They may not be normal. They may not be normal members I of that you. particular age yeah. group. They bring a slightly different sophistication. Yeah. No, you're right. To the I'm, table. I'm overreaching when but, I say authoritarianism, but right, they don't seem to love democracy as much as this I, generation. Well, I think. I, and I, so I'll answer that question, which is, I think democracy can be messy. And there's no doubt about that. It's one of the hallmarks of democracy. And when you are a young person, um, you may be looking for a little bit more order and certainty than democracy is able to deliver. Um, I think the problem with poll questions like this, like that, is that the question you have to ask is, compared to what? Mm-hmm. So they may not be fully satisfied with the, with, the, with the structural status quo, and there's a lot not to be satisfied with. Mm-hmm. But if you then line up what we have versus what the choices are, you're not going to find any other choice that's going to gain a majority, uh, a majority of acceptance from that age group or from any other age group. You said democracy's messy. It sure is. And we saw some very messy democracy earlier this year. We had a big convoy take over our nation's capital. We also, at at the bridge that has more commerce over it than anything else, maybe in the world, uh, the Ambassador Bridge in um, Detroit, Windsor, um, you know, they tried to take that over as well. And there were billions and billions of dollars worth of goods and services that couldn't get across that bridge, adversely affecting both of our economies because of this convoy. And I wonder whether, how close did the U.S. come to getting involved in resolving all of that? So, first of all, I'll just I'll put a number on it for you if you want, which sure. is um, over $300 million a day in good products and goods crosses the Ambassador Bridge. That's a lot. $300 million dollars a day. Yeah. That is a lot. By the way, um, I visited the Ambassador Bridge yesterday, mm-hmm. um, and I 
also, and I also visited the construction site for the Gordy Howe Bridge, which will provide a second, more modern span going between Detroit and Windsor, which which we're will, paying for, which will which Canada is paying for, but which will improve the resiliency of the supply chain, and I think dramatically reduce or eliminate the possibility of that type of a blockade okay. being successful but having, again. Ha having, I, I mean, you've re-emphasized here the importance of that space. No doubt about so it. So how close did the U.S. come to getting involved? So I know getting involved is a vague term. I mean, the United States was involved. I mean, uh, how about I cleaning was, it up? I, I, don't, I don't think the United States came close to that at all. I think mm -hmm. there were many conversations, cabinet-level conversations. I was having conversations with ministers, I was reinforcing what our cabinet members were saying to their counterparts in Canada. There was um, White House involvement. There was a lot of advice being given, and it was advice. It wasn't do this, do that. It was, gee whiz, we're thinking about this. What's your reaction to that? And I, so, but there was no anger. I want to be clear. I mean, this is a place, I remember it was early on in my ambassadorship. It was the first time I had a chance yeah. to observe you got the way in, in which December, our two I guess, and got here in December February. 1st, exactly. Yeah. So it was exactly what I would hope would happen between two friends and allies who cared about each other, who respect the sovereignty of each other's nations, mm -hmm. but who knew that we collectively had a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. And I think Canada, um, you know, you can, you can quibble about whether it took too long but ultimately, Canada took the steps that were necessary. They reopened the bridge. They cleared the truckers um, out of the out of the city of Ottawa. There was damage. I'm not going to say there wasn't any damage, but I think there were lessons learned. And the two countries have continued to talk about how we make sure this doesn't happen again. How do we make our supply chain more secure and more resilient? Those conversations are ongoing. Um, and I and, and they're collaborative. They're collaborative and they're constructive, and that is the hallmark of the U.S.-Canada relationship. All right. Your, your staff are going to have a coronary if I keep going too long here, so I'm going to ask you one last question. Right. And since I started with a fairly easy question, I'm going to end with a fairly easy question as well, which is, you know the speculation that's going on in your country about whether or not the former guy is going to run again in 2024 and whether, of course, the current guy is going to run again in 2024. <laughs> Uh, do you know, incidentally, whether the president's made up his mind about re-election? Um, all I know is what the president has said, which is he's running for re-election. Um, I can also express, like I, I'm the U.S. ambassador to Canada. I'm not, I used to be a political consultant and a political advisor. <laughs> I try to do as little of that as possible in this okay. job. But I will say on a personal level um, that I don't know of anyone else in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party who is as qualified as Joe Biden to be president of the United States, who can do as good a job domestically and internationally as Joe Biden is doing. And so I can say I certainly hope that he does, um, that he does decide to run for president. Um, but as I said, all I know is what he has said, okay, which is that so he is running for president. Let me ask you about the flip side of that coin, and that is, if Donald Trump runs, and if he wins again, a lot of ifs admittedly, how concerned are you that all of the work that you will have done in the previous four years will be for naught? So I, on, on the one hand, I can't control myself and say that if the other guy, um, Actually, I think in, in, uh, at times the president has nailed this right, the other defeated guy. <laughs> um, if I don't know that he's going to run. If he does run, um, I would like to think that he would not be reelected. He would not be elected again. Um, you know, there's an old, uh, there's an old expression um, that you can, you, can fool, you can fool some of the people some of the time you can't fool all the people all the time, and you can't do it twice. So I don't think that he could win. If he does win, I have enough confidence in the institutional forces in the democracy of the United States, some political, um, that is uh, the Congress, and some private business community, business leaders, um, non-political leaders of the country who have no interest in seeing the United States backslide in its foreign affairs and relations globally, and that certainly includes Canada. 
Ambassador David Cohen from the U.S. to Canada, the pride of Philadelphia, big Eagles fan. Fly, Eagles, fly. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you here at TVO and uh, enjoy the rest of your term here in Canada. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the air. And um, I'm not supposed to say this, but uh, anytime you want me back, I'd be, I'd be honored to be able to come back and talk more. We'll take you up on that. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. While inflation may may be leveling out. Right now, it's raising prices at an average of 7% over last year. From mortgage rates to grocery bills, life is obviously more expensive. Jackie Porter is a certified financial planner at Cart Wealth Management, and she joins us now on how to manage in these uncertain times. It's great to have you here in the studio. It's so awesome to be here. IRL, we were talking about. IRL. In real life. Yeah, for the kids, that means <laughs> exactly. in real life. That's right. Well, okay, inflation at 7%. You've no doubt been in regular contact with your clients. How are they faring? I think some are faring better than others. I think... Uh, people I find, and, and this is also proven by FP Canada, people who work with planners tend to feel a bit more confident, but the people who are coming into my practice um, who are having an opportunity to talk about their current financial situation, the pain is real. And some of the things they're saying is that they bought a house during the pandemic and um, felt like you know money was coming in, cash was fairly free flowing, mm -hmm. their money was on lockdown pretty much. And, and realistically speaking, they're worried about their mortgage renewing in, you know, maybe they took a three year mortgage and they're thinking, will I be able to continue to afford to live in my home is some of the things I'm hearing on the street. Were your clients like many people in as much as over the last two, two and a half years, some of it under lockdown, they were saving a lot because you couldn't get out and spend it. Correct. H having said that, there's some research that suggests that people haven't spent much during the pandemic except for when it comes to buying homes. So mm. mortgages actually make up three quarter of uh, Canadian household debt right now. Our debt, to, yeah, our debt to income ratio, I think I saw a number the other day, 180%, which is yes. <laughs> pretty high. Now, when interest rates are very, very low, that's not problematic. How about now? It's, it's problematic because I think people were feeling pretty good and they were doing a pretty good job of savings because the good news is it was up to almost 1.87 per dollar of mm. income earned prior to the pandemic coming on. So that just before the pandemic, it, you know, debt was at a whole time high. So it came down, finances were in lockdown. But I think what happened is people got really comfortable taking on debt during the lockdown, potentially buying homes. And that's troubling because if interest rates continue to go up, um, they're relying on their home continuing to go up. And we're seeing with interest rates going up, homes prices are going down. Mm -hmm. So even in selling the house, they might not necessarily have a scenario where they have more cash on hand because the house might not be worth what they were hoping it would be worth. So that's something to consider. In which case, do you anticipate that people's debt levels are going to get a lot worse before they get better? They're going to get a lot worse. I think that especially now, if people aren't getting in front of this, thinking about what their actual cash flow looks like, because a really big thing that happened during the pandemic is people were saving. They didn't have to think about it. They also didn't have to think about spending. Right? right. So now they're not necessarily looking at their balance sheet. They're not necessarily looking at how much money is going out and how much money is coming in. They might be worried about it, but they're not doing anything about now, it. Why not? What, what is the what is the mindset that says, well, you know, we're just going to continue spending tickety boo and we don't worry about how much is coming in? I think sometimes looking might be as painful as <laughs> for, for people. Right. Yeah. So just thinking, let me have a closer look at this. Maybe what they find out they'll not like. Maybe it'll mean that they'll have to make decisions because some of the people I'm talking to now are like, can I afford to stay in my home? Will it be a scenario that I'll have to sell? There is some emotion tied to that. And sometimes it's easier to talk through something like that with someone than looking at your numbers yourself and maybe not liking what you see, right? We don't like to make decisions, do we? No. Better to put it off for another day. No, no. Rather worry about it than do something <laughs> about it, right? All right. Let's put this graph up here because we're going to just show some... We're going to show some of the, uh, the brutal reality of the last little while. Bank of Canada interest rates hike. Okay, from April 2020 until March 2022, so it's basically during the, the, the worst of COVID, interest rates were almost at zero, 0.25. And they have been climbing up ever since. 1% in April, then 1.5% in June, 2.5% in July, and now we're sitting at 3.25%. I know your clients, you say you don't, they don't like to necessarily make decisions. 
but, but this is a decision that is facing them stark in the face. So how are they regarding this? It's it's concerning. I mean, I think people are, are kind of facing the double whammy of seeing costs of everything go up, including, you know, groceries, gas, all the essential items that they need, and seeing their investments go down. <laughs> We're in a market mm -hmm. that's been fairly volatile. And just worrying about also seeing that their income, real income, and, you know, for a lot of Canadians, real income hasn't gone up. It's done nothing. So, yeah. so that's really putting them in a scenario where... Their debt's creeping up, and you know they're, the Bank of Canada the, the, and CMHC is predicting that people are going to start having a scenario where they're they're not going to be able to afford to stay in their home, and, and debts are going to be defaulted on. Well, some worse than others, and I and I point that out because we are we are a people that still likes to own a home, right? That's right. Sixty-six percent, I gather, of adults uh, in Canada own a home, and fifteen percent of Ontario owners, homeowners own multiple properties. 15% own multiple properties. Um, how many of them are your clients and what are they saying right now? <laughs> well, I, I think even, so I have some clients who are multiple property owners, myself included, and I've, quite a few of them who have been playing the markets, taking the extra cash flow that they have, because Canadians, you're right, we, are, we love our homes mm -hmm. and we tend to regard our homes as piggy banks. That's how we ended up in this mess, right? We started taking on more debt than the Americans over the last few years because we kept thinking home prices were going to go up and up. The reality is, as interest rates go up, fewer people are in the market to buy, and demand and supply say your home price is just not going to continue to do that. So it's really time for people to take a real close look at if you're a Canadian looking to buy a home right now, is that going to be re a reality for you? Should you buy a home now, interest rates could con double. Could you afford mm -hmm. to do that? So living within your means is, is something that I think more and more Canadians are waking up to, especially as they're seeing if you're not doing a budget, guess what happens? You, your debt levels just keep creeping up. So one day your credit card statements where people, Canadians tend to like to put the money that they um, don't have mm -hmm. on, and then they just keep seeing that continue to go up and it just makes your lifestyle unattainable. So this is just a good time to take a real close look at your circumstances. Consider, you know, is it still a viable option to own a home, especially in the desert of the city where <laughs> homes are particularly unaffordable? Potentially look at other options. I mean, there, there are options like maybe living, renting in the city if that's your desire and owning a property elsewhere. Um, it's definitely a good time to know your numbers. So don't wait till the pain is real. Like, don't wait. I, I'm the person who goes to the dentist when the pain is real. <laughs> I'm not a good example. Do not wait till the pain is real and you're seeing it a struggle to actually pay those bills. Okay, so you be the Novocaine right now <laughs> and, and, and make the pain go away. But in doing so, I mean, what do you think you are really going to have clients who are going to sell their homes because they're worried they're not going to be able to keep them over the next period of time? Well, I'm seeing that right now. You're seeing it. They oh, are yeah. selling their homes. Yeah, some people are selling their homes, um, potentially more multiple homeowners. Hmm. But that's just the beginning. The, I mean, as I said, the closer people get to the reality of getting beyond their means and seeing it in real time with their credit card balances and real income not going up and everything else going up, there's made major decisions, hard choices that need to be made. I wonder if there's a silver lining here, Jackie, in as much as we know that there are lots of millennials who have been trying to get into the housing market and they have been saving as best they can and maybe, you know, tapping the bank of mom and dad a little bit for yes. a loan or some, for some <laughs> help is. there. Yeah. Uh, but the prices have been just so crazy they can't get in. Well, if prices are coming down right now, is this their shot to get in the housing market? It, you know what? It very well could be. And what I'm seeing more of is millennials teaming up to buy property. So hmm. perhaps, um, you know, friends getting together with other friends um, and setting up a co co like a contract on how they would do that because there is an opportunity. But again, the reality is, are you going to do it on your own? Are you going to get a property that has a place with a, uh, a basement or an opportunity to rent out? And the other piece is, is you really want to talk to a mortgage broker long before you want to buy a property because the other issue is the auditing concern of the bank of, of, of mortgage brokers is they're, they're worried that if they take on the wrong client in this market, that, that it could end up being a scenario where they're audited hmm. and just because they want to make sure you meet those stress test requirements. Sure. So 
If you're a millennial looking to buy a house, make sure you can meet those test, stress test requirements, not just for a mortgage worker, but for yourself. Again, recognizing property values may not go up the way they used to, also considering that interest rates could continue to go up. Could you continue to afford? What's your plan? Have a plan. Uh, is there much of this phenomenon going on where people are actually losing their mortgages because they can't pass the stress test? Is that happening? Well, they're not losing the mortgages. I'm, I'm saying more to get into the housing market. Okay. I think that mortgages will continue to renew. Um, there won't be any issue, at least as far as I can tell, hmm. with those terms changing. It's, it's a question of when people get their mortgage statement and, and it says, here's our offer. You know, it's 5%, it's 5.5%, and you were paying 2.2%. That's a real wake-up call. You bet. That scenario you just gave, where, where let's say a couple of people who on their own could not afford a house, but they team up and they decide to buy a property together. Financially, that makes perfect sense. Actually, does that work? Well, you, have, you raise a good point. I mean, there's a lot of, of um, legal things to consider, like the other person getting married, or, you know, um, a pa someone passes away, what happens? Someone wants to sell, what happens? There's yeah. lots of things to consider. So something like that should not be done without getting proper legal advice and talking through the scenarios on how you would react. Hmm. How, how flush do you have to be right now to get into the housing market? Because the prices may be better, but the rates are going to be higher. So what's the advice there? I, I think, again, get, get the advice of the mortgage broker, because I mm -hmm. feel like that sand is shifting all the time, mm -hmm. and, and the um, circumstances, the climate around that is changing all the time. So just assume that, um, you know, in the city is a lot more expensive. There's going to be a lot more requirements that you're going to need to be able to afford a home in the city. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where you need to buy. Like, again... Look at your options. Potentially mm -hmm. consider buying in a more affordable area where work-life balance might also be a, a better priority and your real income might have a chance. Hello, Hamilton, Ontario. <laughs> right? I don't know. Is that the case? Well, uh, listen, I know, I know, uh, I mean, we've had people who work here who, uh, and I know people who, you know, live mu much of their life in midtown, downtown Toronto and decided, you know what, I can buy twice as much house for half as much money in Hamilton. And if you don't have to come into work every day anymore, why not? Very, very good point. I, what I'm seeing as well are uh, millennials in particular buying out in like places like Windsor. And well, that's really far. Yeah. yeah. But, but they can buy a place that they can build equity, yep. maybe, some, maybe some passive income, and live in the city, rent, continue to rent in the city. So it just, again, thinking through your options, don't wait till the pain is real. Yeah. Having a plan is really, really important, and that all-important emergency fund. Now more than ever, it's important to have that fund so that if things slip under your feet, you have uh, footing, especially with jobs, people's job situation changing all the time. Do, will they have a job, you know, with all these big tech companies laying off? If you're one of them, what's your plan? Okay, the emergency fund. Yeah. So you get paid. Let's <laughs> assume you got a job. You get paid. Pay yourself first, right? Right. Pay yourself first. In other words, save. Right. Should that emergency fund be a separate something that is not part of your regular savings account, not part of your regular checking account? It's a different thing? It, it's a different thing. It should be three to six months of your lifestyle costs, which again, you need to know what they are sure. to make this all make sense. Um, but three to six months of your lifestyle costs, preferably these days, uh, the good news is that people can get higher interest rates on savings accounts, yep. short-term GICs, things like that. Who knew that we'd finally be in a scenario where we'd have real returns on GICs again? But that's a good place to park your short-term emergency fund, and it really should only be used for what I'm talking about, not for your consumer purchases, mm -hmm. but for a real emergency. That, so that is a serious rainy day fund that you don't chat, you, you don't dip into that because you want a new TV set. That's something you, you put it over there and you don't touch it. A hundred percent. And and actually and doing that exercise, I really encourage people to really put your pen to paper because your hmm. financial expenses have likely changed since the start of the pandemic and you probably don't know what everything costs anymore. Right. So you will have some comfort in seeing the numbers, seeing what everything is costing and then having a plan from there. Now there was a time, I guess it's been a long time, that uh, you know if anybody was going to put money into guaranteed income certificates, people would say, that's very unimaginative. But I guess we're in a situation now with interest rates rising that these the GICs are coming back. What can you make now in a GIC? 
you could make, um, I mean, some more competitive institutions are offering up to 5% for five years um, on a shorter term, you know, 3.5%. So hmm. this is actually a time where it's not keeping up with inflation. It's not keeping up with inflation, not in no. The sh not in the short term, but, you know, over 30 years, inflation tends to balance out and it's around the, you know, 3% uh, mark. So hmm. for the short term, it's a great place to park your money because who wants to bet on what inflation is going to be in the future? I don't. <laughs> Right. I think the, the key thing is to, to basically set aside that money, know you have it, so that you have some way of dealing with uncertainty. Safest way to go right now, I guess. Well, next to savings bonds, which are, which are still paying still nothing, not, right? Still not paying very much. Still paying bubkas. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, keep going. Other advice for savers right now. If we really want to sort of work on that emergency fund, if we want to save up, again, potentially for a house or just to make sure we have that balance in our lives, what are you recommending? I think just delay making any other major purchases that you don't, that isn't a need, hmm. right? You know, again, this is a time to really know the difference between what a need is and what a want is. A lot of people don't get that difference, do they? No, no. And yeah. I, I remember I used to do a financial literacy course and it was for really young middle school kids and in, in one of those neighborhoods where um, at-risk youth, like people who are at-risk youth lived. Mm. And I remember a young lady I, that I was asking the question to, what's the difference between a need and a want? And she's like, a need is something you really, really need and a want is something you really, really want, <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's a lot of my clients and lots of people who don't know the difference. That's very funny, <laughs> except it's not, but it's, it is, yeah, but not. it is. Uh, okay, you're in the financial planning business. I don't know how much you get paid to dispense your advice, but presumably there are gonna be some people out there that need advice and can't afford a financial planner. What do they do? I think get, there's actually um, Plan, I think it was Plan Canada. There's a, a few organizations, charitable organizations out there where you can get advice for free. There's credit counseling. If you're someone who's struggling with debt and you, you're concerned that you're gonna be able to pay your debts at the end of the month. So there's mm. credit counseling, there's lots of places. Advocates actually, Advocates, which is an organization I belong to, is has a service they had through the pandemic where they were offering free financial advice to uh, business owners and individuals that needed help during the pandemic. So, you know, definitely check out the resources. Check out, search Google free financial planning and just see what's available to you. If you're looking to make a change in your current circumstances or you're worried about the fact that your lifestyle may not be sustainable. Right. How does it work for most financial planners? Do they sort of take a piece of every action or is there a flat fee it's that a, they it's pay? It's a or? flat fee. Typically, mm -hmm. um, financial planners charge a fee anywhere, just depending on, you know, your the complexity of your financial circumstances. So um, it, it could be an hourly fee, it could be a flat fee, as I said, maybe for a certain amount of meetings. Mm -hmm. But you can definitely definitely search, again, advocates, or you could also search FP Canada, search for financial planner there. It's a great uh, resource to see you know, what's available, different types of planners, what do you need help in, because you can get people that specialize in everything from divorce to women to business owners to couples. Hmm. So definitely search there. And That's the good. average, this may be proprietary information, so forgive me if it is, but the, your clients on average make how much a year? On average, clients make somewhere between, let's say, like 125 and and up. <laughs> you're, so you're in the higher end of things. Okay, gotcha. And are you turning that 125 into 250? Well, you know what? I think people understand that wealth is about building wealth or passive income over the long term, whether it's for retirement or, you know, for um, a big purchase that they may want in the future. But I think it's all about, wealth is about consistently looking at ways to build income. Mm. That's the big difference between get rich and wealth. Right, understood. We got 20 seconds left here. Uh, I know these are really miserable times for a lot of people who see their paychecks purchasing less and less with inflation being as high as it is. Difficult time maybe to get a better job in order to improve your economic circumstances. What's the one thing you'd tell people to do to improve their economic circumstances? I'd say take action. Don't stay in your head. If you're somebody who's worrying about your finances and even now, even during the pandemic, FP Canada put out a report that said people were more worried about their finances during the pandemic than about the pandemic, about a health issue. Huh. So I think that this is a time where circumstances have gotten even more precarious because we were spending less. Some people are going back to work, they're coming out of remote, they're having to spend money on lunches, driving, gas, all of those things again. Mm. So it's time to, to really put pen to paper, know your numbers, and feel good about your circumstances. Build a plan for the future that you can rely on. Good stuff. Jackie Porter, Certified Financial Planner, Cart Wealth Management. Thanks for coming in tonight. Always a pleasure, Steve.
While many people in Ontario have had a chance to see the royal family over the years, there can't be too many people who've seen them more than Tom Sandler. When there's a big event in Ontario, Sandler is the photographer extraordinaire who gets the call. And he joins us now to share some pictures and memories of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth and the new King, Charles III. Great to see you again, Nice Tommy. to be here. Doing? Thank you. Doing very well. Excellent. Thanks. Let me start with a generic question. The royals, I mean, there's no one in the world who's been photographed more than them, right? Probably So when not. you're taking their pictures, what are you looking for? Well, usually, you know, they're here for a reason, so there's probably something going on where they're going to sign something or cut a ribbon, but you're looking for, I, I, I like to find reactions with people. Those are the spontaneous moments that uh, have a lot of emotion to them and, uh, and depth to them. So uh, there's a lot going on, but, you know, you can really focus it down to some very specific things. Are you always on the look for something like a mishap? Do you want to capture that <laughs> um part of me part of me does yeah but the mo the majority part of me says don't do it tom because <laughs> i'm actually the official photographer so ah. you i have to be behaving i have to behave they so. wouldn't take kindly to something no was... i don't think it would be asked back to the party if i did that <laughs> gotcha okay well let's look at a few of your pictures that you've taken over the years and here is sheldon let's go with number one right now this is i mean that's her at her regal best there, right? Yes. Tell yes. us the story behind this picture here, the queen smiling. Um, I believe uh, that was at, uh, I'm not sure if that was at Pinewood Studios. It was, yeah. Yeah, Pinewood. that was at Pinewood Studios. And that was uh, during a very large reception. And um, it was a very nice moment of her. I like, I, I like to take the high road with all the work that I do. And I find that the great energy is there. And it really reflected... Um, her energy and her kindness and her and her friendliness to people. She really so, sparkles there, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah, it was a really nice shot. That was a real sparkly yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we, we know how much she adored her husband, and you had numerous opportunities <laughs> to take pictures of Elizabeth and Philip together. Yes. So let's do picture number two now, Sheldon. Okay, what's this one? Uh, that was, the, I, I believe that was the same day, because she's wearing the same hat and same outfit, but that was at, uh, at the ledge at Queen's Park, and she was there for... Um, it could have been the Ontario um, um, uh, Service uh, Awards for volunteering and for... Um, Although I for see that. Premier Jason Kenney's in the background there. Now, mind you, he, was, he would have been a federal minister at that time. So. Uh, yes, that's, that's and, true. And, and look at the look on her face, Tom. She looks quite... Serious. serious. Yes, well, that's the word. Well, they run a gambit of, of, of emotions and, and, and expressions, and when they are have to be serious, they get, they get very serious. Right. And when it's lightened up and it's more personal, the guards come down and it's a whole different ball game. How about him? Was he, was, I mean, he was sort of notoriously more... Yes, the word serious. We're looking for here. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say serious, I was gonna say, you know, so, uh, maybe a, a little less patience for difficult situations. Yes, that's true, that's true. Uh, there was one instance, uh, if I can tell the story, where Please. actually the, the Queen engaged me in a conversation because I had to do a very formal group shot uh, at, the, at the Royal York Hotel, and um, 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 she um, came over to me. Well, the, the, the bottom line was Buckingham Palace told me the rules were that you, I was only allowed to take three photos because there was another group shot done by another photographer and the photographer kept shooting because they wanted more poses and, and, and Prince Philip got a little annoyed and he stood up and he walked out of the room. Oh, so really? they were a little concerned that uh, they didn't want that to happen again and I certainly didn't want that to happen again. So. You have to play by the rules. So they say you only get three shots, and you have to announce that you're only doing three shots. It's all very formal and very proper. So it's a little tense because you've got 30 people in a group shot, and you know, what are the chances of somebody blinking and somebody not looking right? Even the queen could blink. So, you know, with three shots, it's tense. So I got it all set up. I made the announcement. I plugged in, it was a Hasselblad at the time in the days of film, and I had umbrellas all over the room. And I go, here's the first shot. And I hit the button, and the camera goes clunk, and the lights just kind of died. Nothing went off. The room stayed dark. So now I've got two shots left. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not a good. So I got it going again. And I, I said, OK, here's the shot. So I click. It goes off. Bang, everything happens. I did the third shot. Click, bang, it goes off. I got the shot. To my eyes, everything looked good. I didn't have digital. I couldn't look at it. So I was just praying that everything was going to be looking good. Finish the shoot. I said, thank you very much. I get down off the ladder and I look across the room and I see the queen gets up and the queen's, and I, and I see her, it looks like she's walking towards me. 
So sure enough, she leaves everybody behind, all these big executives and VIPs that she's supposed to be meeting and greeting and talking to, and she's walking across the room to come over to, to me. And I'm going, okay, what's going on here? So she walks right up to me and I said, Hello, Your Majesty. How are you? She says, I'm fine. <laughs> I said, is there something I can do for you? She says, well, I just want to tell you that your flash didn't go off on the first photo. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> OK, I'm not going to argue with you. And um, that was it. She actually really just came over um, to be friendly and to you know be sincere, that she really thought I didn't know that there was an equipment problem. What a lovely moment. And it was really a lovely yeah. moment. And all of a sudden, it wasn't like I was talking to the queen. It was just like I was talking to my, a, a good friend of mine, you know? And she was just so delightful and so real. And uh, it, it just left me um, just, you know, just so happy that, uh, you know, I said, well, thank you very much, you know? I think the word you're looking for is kvelling. <laughs> I think you were kvelling. Yes. Okay, back to the pictures here. Here yes. is the Queen at Ontario Place yes. on the waterfront in Toronto. And what... That was way back, I think that was around 2002 or 2004, one of her visits. What little kid would not want to experience well, that? Well, that's, that's the moment that, you know, is everybody's, every kid's dream. That, that's um, 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 Jim Janu in the back. He ran Ontario Place. Oh, yes. I believe that's his granddaughter. And, ah. uh, you know, the, she brought her there. And that was just this beautiful moment. And you can see with Her Majesty that she really connects. And, uh, you know, it's not just phony. She really actually enjoys people and meeting people. And... Mm. She also has that air about her that she really is um, very dedicated to caring about what she does and who she is. Like she's on a higher mission and mm -hmm. it's just really quite nice to see. You never did ask her when she came over to ask you about the <laughs> photograph, what, what do you keep in that handbag, Your Majesty? <laughs> you ever wonder that, what, what she kept in the handbag? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's I'm probably being a Colt 45. I'm being ridiculous. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Uh, next picture. Here is another picture of Her Majesty. This yes. with former Ontario Premier Dalton McGuinty. And, yes. and what's with the shades here? Well, that was a, a, a great moment. and. Uh, um, uh, she went to a tour at Pinewood Studios, and uh, this was a tour of actually, she saw a performance of, a, it was a ballet, and it was, it was a, um, a performance, and they were showing her about 3D technology in, mm. in, uh, in, in Ontario, and, and what we, how advanced we are. So at the end of the performance, they came over and they gave her a set of shades, where they're actually 3D glasses, hmm. uh, but they have the royal insignia on the side, which well, they is, is kind of cool. Yeah, huh. that would be a nice collector's item to have. Now, presumably, the, the queen would, would know ahead of time that she was going to get handed a pair of glasses and going to be photographed yes. with those glasses on. Yes. And they would want to make sure that, she, you know, she didn't look ridiculous in those glasses. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a bit of a stretch, actually, you know, because mm -hmm. I was... Uh, but she's a good sport, you know, and... Mm -hmm. um, she, she knows that it's for a good cause, and um, she knows it's going to help help our technology. And, and, the and a British company, too, I guess, right? Pinewood Studios, uh, the originals that's right. of England. That's right. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. That's right. Well, the queen is dead. Long live the king. Yes. Next shot, please, Sheldon. Here's the next one. This is Charles and Camilla, who, of course, uh, were... Now, how long ago was this, do we figure? That was uh, also around... I think that was around 2004. Four. I was going to say, it's got to be 15 years ago yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah, and that was a tour of, uh, they came here and uh, that was in Hamilton at uh, Dundurn Castle. Castle. Right. And apparently, you know, she has a great history there with her great, great, great grandfather, I believe. Hmm. Um, and they went to see the, uh, the old homestead. <laughs> And uh, that was near the end of the visit where they came out and waved to the crowd. And it was a very nice moment. And again, when you're trying to capture a moment like that for the history books, what are you looking for? Well, you just know when you have it in, in your crosshairs. For some reason, you know, it's very much like, I used to call it Jedi photography. And because you could just know it and you just know it. And I think that comes with a little bit of instincts and um, mm -hmm. but 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 as you said before everything is very choreographed like you know exactly I have a book of their agendas and you know it says at 1237 they will meet blah 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 1239 they will go to the balcony at 12 and, and right. you but still you could take 20 pictures of them and their expressions could be kind of just off yeah. on, on all 20 yeah that's true well yes and no because they're they're pretty well pro professionals at, at doing this mm. and uh, they, they they give you the moment they've you know? done it before they hand it to you <laughs> <And> they know <laughs> what they're right. doing all right, here's, uh, this one I think is just lovely. I mean, if this just doesn't sum up yes, the, that's very... the queen and her people in some respects. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that was at, uh, at Queen's Park also. Um, Harkening back to how much you saw her loving to be with people. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, really, uh, it's really a warm um, uh, situation with her, and she's very genuine, and she gives everybody as much time as she possibly can. I was with Prince Edward once, and uh, we were a very tight schedule, but we went to a veteran's uh, hospital, and <clears throat> he was supposed to leave, um, you know, within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but he stayed for pretty well much an hour because he didn't, he wouldn't leave until he spoke to everybody that was there. Hmm. And he sat down with them, and he shook hands with them. They all had stories to tell about the war and about their parents and about his parents. And it was a very genuine, you know, um, event that mm. I found with him. And I found that the dedication to that with them was very deep and very, very real. I don't know if you've been taking pictures professionally for 70 years, <laughs> as she did her job for 70 years. <laughs> yes. But you might, you know. You might. <laughs> well, you could we'll keep going see. for a long time. Well, I'm about, I think I'm about the halfway mark, actually. What you are you, you're probably into this, what, 40, 50 years by now? Uh, no, no. Professional no, photographer? No, no, not that much. I, I started late in life, and I'm probably uh, in my 30th year right now. That's oh, well, you've got a long way to go. <laughs> you've got to live to 110 or 120 <laughs> if you're going to catch up to her then. I don't know if that's... <laughs> I don't know if I should wish that. <laughs> okay. You know what? It's great of you to come in and share some of your memories Thank of Her you Majesty very much. and Thank your you. pictures, which are, as you know, always so splendid. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Tom Sandler, photographer extraordinaire. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, October 4th, 2022. Tomorrow, does history, or the teaching of it, matter more or less in our current era? We'll debate that. Also, writer Marsha Liederman is with us on recovering the story of her parents before and after they survived the Holocaust. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.